Well, uh, we have uh, gotten into the book of Job now. This is like our seventh week in it. Uh, Job has been afflicted with great malady and disaster and heartache and affliction, disease. I don't know what his disease is, but he's got sores all over his body and he's in great pain. Uh, and Job has complained. Uh, then he had this friend, uh, uh, Eliphaz, try to correct him and accuse him of doing wrong. Job complained again. And then Job's second friend named Bildad, he speaks up. He's been listening to Job complain, and uh, Job's just talking about his misery and how he's just not happy at all, yet he maintains his integrity, and Bildad just can't take it anymore, so he's got to open his mouth and talk, which is what he does. Verse, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, let's start there. Then Bildad, the Shuhite, replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will, if you, but if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. Your beginnings will, be hum will seem humble, so prosperous will be your future. Job, second friend, listens to Job complain, and all he's thinking is, Job, you're just speaking nonsense. You're rambling off all kinds of nonsense. We know God's ways. The reason your children died is because they sinned. Probably one of those parties they had where they had, everybody came over, and Job would even have sacrifices the next day because he was afraid they might have sinned. Well, this guy just goes out and says it. You, you guys probably, they, they probably sinned. That's why God took them away. And Job, even you, you need to look to God. You need to plead with the Almighty. You need to repent. If you want God to show you favor and restore, your, uh, restore you and bless your future, you have to repent and turn to him. That's what he's saying. You have to repent. If... You are pure and upright. Which basically means he's saying to Job, Job, I don't believe you are pure and upright. Now we know Job is pure and upright because God says it. We know that Job's the most righteous man on the earth. God says it. Now here's his friend saying, you're not pure and you're not upright. He doesn't believe that he is. But he continues in verse 8. Ask the former generations and find out what their fathers learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing. And our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? Now, back in the uh, rant that Eliphaz made against Job, Eliphaz claimed a special revelation. He had some kind of vision at night or some Spirit came and told him what to tell Job or about the situation between suffering and sin. He claimed to have a revelation. Bildad just says, hey, let's just study history. We might not know much ourselves. I was born yesterday. You know that, that I wasn't born yesterday. I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Well, I was born last night. I really don't know anything. That's what he said. And we don't know anything. And we don't have much time in our life to actually learn very much. We don't know much, and we don't have much time to learn. But they do. Our forefathers do. And you can glean a whole lot of truth from all the accumulated wisdom from all the people in the past. You can understand some things that they say. Just study them. Do that, Job. Study the past. Study history. The former generations. Ask them. They'll tell you that what we're saying is true. It goes on, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 11 through 18. Can papyrus grow where tall? Can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? No. Can reeds thrive without water? No. While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes, so perishes the hope of the godless. 
What he trusts in is fragile. What he relies on is a spider's web. He leans on his web, but it gives way, and he clings to it, but it does not hold. He is like a well-watered plant in the sunshine, spreading its shoots over the garden. It entwines its roots around a pile of rocks and looks for a place among the stones, but when it is torn from its spot, that place disowns it and says, I never saw you. I mean, it's just a poetic, very poetic way of um, saying Job. The destiny of all who forget God is ruin. Is that not true? Is that true? The destiny of all who forget God, the destiny of all who are godless, they perish. They will perish. No matter how much they flourish for a little while, no matter how good it looks for a while, the destiny of those who forget God and are godless is grim. They're not going to make it. I think it's true. It is true. So Bill Dad says some true things to Job. And he continues in verse 19. Surely its life withers away, and from the soil other plants grow. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. Surely God, God doesn't reject a blameless man. Job, if you would just repent, he means you, Job. Bildad's talking to you, Job. I mean you. If you would just repent, if you, you're the one who's forgotten God. You're the one who is the evildoer here. You're not blameless. That's what he's saying to him. He's using this poetic language to say, I'm talking about you, Job. If you will repent, God will restore and renew your joy and blessings. Didn't Bill Dad such a good friend to remind Job of all these things? I love it when friends just tell me that stuff. It's your fault, Job. The reason why you're suffering if you, were, if you were righteous, if you were blameless, God wouldn't bring this upon you. But the, the reason why this is brought on you is because you're not blameless. Neato. That's Bildad. That's what he's saying, saying the same thing basically Eliphaz said. But then Job replies in chapter 9. Indeed, I know that this is true. I know you're right. Bill Dad, you're dead on. But how can a mortal be righteous before God? You're right, Bill Dad. Much of what you say is true. The wicked will perish. The wicked are going to go down in ruin. The godless will not inherit life. It's going to be bad. But Job asked this really profound question, a very uh, perplexing, I guess, a uh, confounding question. And I'll get to that later, but the, can a, how can a mortal be righteous before God? And what he means is he's, he's facing these afflictions himself and that God has brought upon him. He knows that God has done it. He even said that, shall we accept good from the Lord and not evil also? God's brought this affliction on me. So God must have a righteous reason to judge Job. But Job doesn't know what it is. And Job maintains his integrity. Job maintains his innocence. I left verse 3. I don't, didn't put it in my notes. I don't know why it's not there. It was there. But the point Job's making is, how do you deal with it? How do you contend with God? How do you, how does just someone who's flesh and blood and mortal and going to die uh, find themselves to have any kind of legal standing before God of righteousness? You can't contend with God. You know why? Because he has all the power. You can't contend with God because he's righteous, and you know he's righteous. He's righteous and all-powerful. How will you possibly have anything to be able to say to him? You can't argue with him. How can you be righteous before God? How can a man, how can anyone be righteous before God? Because you have really, honestly, any of us, even Job, who's the most righteous man on the earth, even Job 
has no case, has no legal case before God. And this is where it starts to, I may be, Get on your nerves a little bit. Job has no legal case before God. He knows it. You can, you're no match for his power, and you know, you're no match for his wisdom. He says it in verse 4 through 10. His wisdom is profound. This is Job talking. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? Nobody. He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion. These are constellations in the sky. They had those back then too. They had the same names that we call them now. The bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He made all that. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. God has power over all creation. Over the entire universe. Over all the universe. God is in control of that. How are you going to contend with him? He made the stars. He made the sun. He made everything that's out there. What are you going to bring? What kind of case are you going to bring to him? He has power over all the creatures too. Verse 11. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. It just said God moves and he, he's so powerful and so I, I don't even know where he's doing. He's just moved by me and he's gone. I didn't see it. But he's making all this stuff happen. And he says, if he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? If he decides he wants to snatch you up and mess up your life, who can say, what are you doing? Anybody? God does not restrain his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. Now, this is not Rahab the harlot in the book of Joshua who hid the spies, hid the two spies and then let them down uh, outside the city wall and then they escaped and then said, remember we, me when y'all come and destroy this place? That's not the same Rahab. This is the Rahab uh, that refers to a sea monster called Rahab. Rahab was like a beast. And God controls the Rahab beast. Even the cohorts of Rahab cower at God's feet. They are no match for him. Even this monster couldn't deal with God. He didn't restrain his anger against them. God does what he wants. God does whatever he wants. He is sovereign over everything in the universe. He does what he wants with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say, what have you done? Nobody can say anything to him or stand up to him. So there, that's, our, that's Job's theology, that's our theology. He's nailing it. How, can the, how then can, any, can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? If he controls Rahab and he controls the stars, how can I say anything to him? He comes and goes and passes by. I didn't even see him. How, how do I have any words to say to, to affect anything in his heart, in his life, legally? Nothing. Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I were innocent, even if I hadn't done anything wrong, I have no words to say to him. All I can say to him and ask him is, please be merciful. It starts to get really deep and really heavy because we think, people think, we are good people. Even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. 
He would not let me regain my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. I mean, he's, Job's really gotten a, uh, it's a true understanding of who God is, but he's really got a negative, bad attitude about God. He's not even going to listen to me. Even if, I, even if I were innocent and I summoned him and he said something, responded, he's not going to really give me a hearing. He's going to say, case dismissed. He'll crush me with a storm, multiply my wounds with no reason, for no reason. In fact, we already learned that. That's back in chapter 2 when Satan approached God again. And God says, how about my man Job? How about Job? I have no one like him in the whole earth, even though you incited me against him for no reason. You incited me to ruin his life for no reason. Here he says it. You multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me regain my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. It is a matter of strength. If it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if it's a matter of justice, who will summon him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Well, okay, that's like a contradiction, isn't it? Or uh, certainly it's, um, what's the word for that? Um, not contradiction. It's just, are both of those things true? If I were really, truly innocent, if I were uh, innocent, well then I would have a case. A paradox. I'm innocent. What's it say? If I were innocent, I'm still condemned. If, I'm, if I were blameless, I'd still be guilty. You don't stand a chance when it comes to a debate of will or a debate of justice or a debate of might with God. You cannot win such a cause even if your cause was right. Now this, I, I think this, the part of this about this that blows my mind is not just that God is sovereign, but that God is sovereign and far transcendent and vast, outside of, beyond anything and everything that we think we are or we are or what we believe or what we say. He is so far outside of us, we can't comprehend it. He said it to Isaiah this way, Isaiah this way, Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, how high are the heavens above the earth? Infinite? Like, what did we say the other day? There are 300 million stars in our galaxy and there, at least as far as I know, there's 300 million galaxies. I heard another one that said, if every single person in the world had a trillion stars, there'd still be stars left over. I don't know, I don't know the number. It's like outrageously mind-blowing. God is so far above us. His thoughts above us, his ways above us. How do you figure it out? When Job says, if I were innocent, I would still be guilty. If I were innocent, I would still condemn myself. He is right, and I'm not. His ways are way out there. Paul writes it this way in Romans 11. 33, great text. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment and his paths beyond tracing out. You can't possibly understand anything about him. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? The answer to those questions is no one. No one has understood the mind of the Lord. No one has been his counselor. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Pay him. No one. If he, I love the, I love, I really do as it's, um, Psalm 50. It's the one right before David's Psalm. This is, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I don't need your food. I own all the cattle of a thousand hills. I, all the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. Who's ever given to God that you should have to, he should repay you? No one. He has everything. He, everything belongs to him. For through him, for from him and through him and to him are, are all things. To him be glory forever. 
So even if you were perfect, even if you were perfect, and I say perfect, I mean because I can't think of a, I'm not, I'm not even close. But even if you were perfect, God's power and God's righteousness would have the effect, once you really grasp the hold of his power, his infinite power, ways higher than your ways, thoughts higher than your thoughts, and you had a, you've, you've got a grasp of his righteousness, it would have the effect of making you look like you were wicked and perverted. I think that's what Isaiah meant when he said, uh, God, God, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Not, not our scumbag stuff, our righteous works, our good things, the things that we do that make us proud, the things that we do that make us feel like we're good people, the good stuff. He calls it righteous white rag, uh, filthy rags. Even if you were righteous, God being all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good and all-righteous would have the effect of making you appear, at least to him, as wicked and perverted. He is so far above us. I think that's what Job is saying here. It says in verse 21, Although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. What I think about me is irrelevant. I despise my own life. Still maintaining his integrity. Although I'm blameless, my life means nothing. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. And when a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. And when the land falls into the hands of, wick, of the wicked, he blindfolds its justice. That's the United States. The land is under the control of the wicked, and the judges are blind. You know why they're blind? God puts a blindfold on them. They, they don't even know truth or justice anymore. When, the, when a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? And that's really your ultimate question about the sovereignty of God. Well, when something bad happens, when something uh, mind-blowing happens to you, it's either God or somebody else. And we know God's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-righteous, uh, sovereign, well, if, he, if, some, if it's somebody else, then he's not sovereign. It's, it's, it's either him or someone else. Who is it? I'm telling you, I'm a, a, a so, I like the way Dave Colvin calls it, a sovereignist. I'm a sovereignist to a fault. I love the sovereignty of God, unless something bad's happening to me, of course. But I love the sovereignty of God. But trying to understand his ways are just very difficult. You know he's sovereign, and you know he does whatever he wants to with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth, and you know that no one can hold back his hand or say, what have you done? That's what you believe. That's what you know. That's what you cling to. That's my theology. I'm not going to change. I'm stuck on it. I believe it, but I just don't get it. God judges however he wants to and whoever he wants to. And he seems, sometimes, according to Job, it's just indiscriminate, too. He destroys the blameless and the wicked. All in the same storm. So it seems to Job, and it seems to us, too, honestly, if it doesn't, who's in control? That God has permitted a scourge, that's what Job says, a scourge that brings sudden death. God has permitted the scourge to exist in the earth. He has allowed injustice. He has allowed calamity to prevail in the earth. And you have to say, well, if, if it's not he, then who? So Job's got some dead on sound theology about the sovereignty of God, even though he's mad at God and he's upset with God judging him for no reason. He knows who God is and what he's like. Verse 25, he says, My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down upon their prey. I mean, your days are gone, man. Like an eagle 
it's, it comes and your days are gone. They're fast. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent. Since I'm already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I wash myself with soap and my hands with wash, washing soda, you would plunge me into a slime pit so that even my clothes would detest me. <laughs> it's like, even, even though I know God is righteous and he's always, he, he, he just don't like me. He's not going to hold me innocent. And I can't fake it either. When you're complaining to God, hey, and you ever go to church and people, hey man, praise the Lord, isn't it God good? Yeah, amen, brother, amen. And you know that guy's miserable. I'm just going to smile, I'm not going to complain. And I want to be that kind of way, I want to be that way, but you just can't handle it some days. And I don't, I'm not saying I want everybody to wallow around in freakish misery, when you really know genuinely, all of us here, God has been gracious. So just a bad day doesn't give you a right to complain, and don't wallow in your complaint. Why, but why bother complaining? God's already decided to make me suffer. He's already decided in Job's mind, Job's mind, he's decided to make me suffer. Why complain? That's what it feels like. Now here's the... What we was reading about Isaiah 55 uh, a while ago. His ways are, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God is holy. And I don't think we understand that word. We don't understand that, that concept. He is holy, which means he is other than us. He is unlike us every way. Now, he has created us in his image, so he has given us attributes which help us understand a little bit. But he's holy. He's holy and he's transcendent. He is outside of space and time. He is outside. He's not in the crea- He's not part of creation. He is imminent and lives with us and um, interacts with us. But he's transcendent and he's holy. So we, even on our best days, we are not even close to having a case that we could bring to him even on our best days. You can never wake up in the morning and go, hey God, aren't you glad I woke up? Here I am. I'm ready to present my case to you. You have, you can't do that. You don't have a defense that will stand against him. And see, this is why I love the gospel. This is why we need Christ. Even on our best days, we're not holy. God is. Even on our best days, something's wrong with us, and not him. And this is why God gave us, the gospel, gave us the gospel. What did Job ask? How can a mortal be righteous before God? How can anyone be righteous before God? Now, I'm going to look at this concept many more times before we get to the end of Job, uh, but I want to look at a little bit of it now. Psalm 143, David writes, verse 2, Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. David, a man's after God's heart, right? A man after God's own heart. No one living is righteous before you. Job says it again. I think this is, Eliphaz says this later in Job 15. What is man that he could be pure? Or one, one born of woman that he could be righteous? What is a... What is man that he could be righteous? He doesn't exist. Job 25, I think this is Bildad later down the road. How then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? He can't. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, there is not a, Solomon writes, there is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. That's, Job's dilemma. We know he's the most righteous man on the earth, upright and blameless, God says. But we know, how can a man be righteous before God? He can't. At least not by his own goodness. 
at least not by his own works, not by his own merit, not by his own giftedness or all the things that he might be, even on his good days. Romans 3, Paul writes, verse 20 through 24, there is, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. We learn to understand God's ways. We learn God's ways. We see what God's ways are, either through a revelation or even through the history, as Bildad says. Check out the old guys. Uh, glean all their wisdom. Put it together and see what, if what I'm saying is true. God doesn't allow the blameless to suffer. God always brings the, the ungodly to ruin. Well, look, through the law we become conscious of sin. I realize how sinful I am. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ brought us righteousness. If there's ever any case that you're going to make before God, if there's any case that you have to bring before God so that you have a defense and you stand, it's because what Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross. He is our defender. He declares us righteous. He gives us his righteousness. We don't stand before God on our own and go, how can a, man, how can a mortal be righteous for, before God? He can't. Jesus is. And I claim that. I want to finish this before you uh, quit tonight. Job 9, 32 through 35. He is not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon both, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would, would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. If there only was a arbiter, if there only was a mediator to stand between me and God, and God put, and the mediator put his hand on me, and he put his hand on God, so that now all the, I can finally bring uh, my case to him because this mediator does it for me, and now God's righteous judgment wouldn't terrify me ever again. I wouldn't be afraid anymore. We do have a mediator. It's Jesus Christ. Paul writes to Timothy, one, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12, 23, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And I really love this one. It doesn't use the word mediator or arbitrator in it. But this is the point. Since the children have flesh and blood, since we have no case to bring before God, he's, God's not a man like us that I might answer him. But since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. He's talking about Christ Jesus became one of us. Christ Jesus took on flesh the God-man. So when Job says, he's not a man like me, that I might answer him, yes, he is, because, because he became a man. He took on flesh and blood, and he might die for us, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know, Fearing death is because you fear what, what's going to happen to you when you die and you stand before God and be judged. That's why it's scary. It's also scary how you might die. I don't want to get eaten by a shark. I don't want to burn in a fire. Something quick and easy. But when you stand before God and you look at him face to face, you have this mediator who took that slavery away, took that fear away. 
And he says, for surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, and I love this, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. He, a merciful and faithful high priest, that's someone who intervenes and intercedes. That's someone who's a mediator. That's someone who's an arbiter. That's someone who comes and stands in between you and puts his hand on you and puts his hand on God and mediates for you. Jesus is that. Jesus is the mediator. He became the merciful and faithful high priest because he made atonement. He satisfied God's wrath by his blood on the cross. He satisfied God's wrath. And Job's going to get there too. But right now, Job's having a hard time. We, we didn't, I missed chapter 9, but Job keeps talking through chapter 10. We'll get that one too next time. So let's try this again next week. Let's pray. Father God, we are glad that you have let us come together tonight to study your word from the book of Job. And Father, I pray that you did, you have taught us, that you have spoken to us, that you have given us insight into your word that we have enjoyed your word and loved your word and delighted in it. Thank you. Thank you. Father God, I just uh, pray that you'll be glorified in our lives by what we heard tonight. Father, uh, give us a good rest of the evening, good fellowship here, a safe trip home, great week. Bless our week. Lord, use us that we might get to share the gospel with someone. Use us, Lord, that we might encourage and minister to those who need help. Bring us back together again Sunday that we can uh, enjoy being together again, worshiping in spirit and truth and studying your word together. Do this, Lord, so Jesus is glorified. I pray this in his name. Amen.